Now, I am pretty sure a lot of you can relate to this. I like to wake up in the middle of the night terrified that I forgot to send an email and muse over all the things that I got wrong during the day or even during the course of my life. And then I like to mentally rehearse everything that I have to do during the day. People I have to see, meetings I have to attend to, reports I have to write. And terrified that I won't be able to get it all done. Everybody else seems to be able to do this. I've spoken to so many people about this and popular worries to have at 3.30 in the morning. You're having a heart attack. You're having a brain tumour. You're not good enough. You're completely messing up in life and really you're the biggest loser in the history of the world. Then I like to check the clock and realise I've only a few hours left to sleep. Then I can really worry like a pro. How will I function with no sleep? And on a good night, it can go from worried that I'll be tired in the morning to not being good enough at my job, not good enough generally, and eventually unemployable. So am I crazy? Well, no more than you if you recognise yourself in any of these stories. This was me before... I had an understanding of the brain. You get anxious because you're smart, because you can think. Let me say that once more. You get anxious because you are smart, because you can think. In my little story, when I showed you in all the ways that I could worry, this was my thinking brain. I'm going to tell you about that now. Your thinking brain is a highly evolved machine and in order for me to explain it to you, I have to take you back a few years. There is a thing called a stress response which is designed to protect and to get out of danger. It's a stress response to help you respond to a particular stress. In this case, the stress will be a bear. At the minute, this horse is calm and relaxed. He's just enjoying his dinner. But if he hears a noise, he becomes alert really quickly. And it's just as well because here comes the bear. Crisis over. He calms down and now he can go back to his dinner. He had a stress response. He responded to the stress. He calmed down and he carried on with what he was doing. The stress response is to take you from being relaxed to mobilising you, getting you ready for something so you can fight or run away. And then you calm down and return to normal. You saw this with the horse when he was calm and relaxed. He then became mobilised for danger. He was getting ready, alert. And because of this quick reaction, this mobilisation of energy, he was able to run away. And then he returned to normal. His body calmed down and he went back to what he was doing. I should note at this point, he's not worrying about his career or what other people think of him or how will he pay the bills or what his boss is going to say. Because thankfully for him, he does not have the capacity for thought like you or I. So he's not subject to anticipatory anxiety and I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. But first of all, I want to look at how you and I do stress. And it's exactly the same process, although we could benefit from tweaking a few things here and there. And just to remind you, I'm going to take you through the same process. The stress response is to take you from being relaxed to mobilising you, getting you ready for something so you can fight or run away. And then you calm down and return to normal. But in reality, we get stuck at step four. And we also seem to have a problem between one and two. What actually is the stressor that gets us to go from relaxed to being mobilised? And I can pretty much guarantee you it's not a bear. Okay, let's take a look at what happens between steps one and two and see if we can figure out where the problem is. Now, the way that the stress response works, to go from step one to step two, it's a pretty big deal. 
For your body to become mobilised, it's using up a huge amount of resources. It takes an incredible amount of energy. So your body really only likes to put you through this stress response in life or death situations. The bear is a good example. It will pull out the stress response for a bear. And why it likes to keep the stress response for crisis situations is because it does an incredible amount of things to your body. I find it useful to think of this as some things getting turned on and some things getting turned off in your body. So during a stressed response, what gets turned on, what gets activated is your heart rate increases, blood pressure increases and your breathing speeds up to allow energy to get to your muscles. Your digestion slows down as there's really no point in digesting your dinner when there's a threat against your life and the repair to your body is halted again because there's no point when you're sorting out a life and death situation and your immune system, it's also compromised. So hopefully you're beginning to see this stress response. It's a pretty big deal. It's hard on your body. But it's warranted if your life's in danger. That's what it's for. When your brain detects a threat, it will turn this on. I think most people have heard of the stress response, but don't necessarily think about it. So I'm going to give you an example that will help to put it into context for you. Say I woke you up from a really deep sleep and said, come on, I want to go for a run. You thought, no, I can't, Ali, and I've no energy. But if I took you by the arm and was forcing you to come with me, you'd be stooped over, practically falling over your feet as you just tried to walk. But if I told you there was a fire, you don't have to try to get the energy. The energy's there. You get a stress response to help you respond to immediate danger. You're gone. This is the stress response in action, mobilising you for danger. Your body is responding to the stress that there might be a fire. So it changes your physiology in the blink of an eye to give you the energy that you need. And in order to do this, there has to be a threat. So I'm going to talk to you about that now, how you and I perceive threats. The best way for me to explain this is to take a minute and talk to you about the difference between fear and anxiety. Fear is what you would experience if there was a threat with you right now, such as having a bear in front of you. What you would experience is fear. Whereas with anxiety, there is nothing in your immediate environment that you can see as a threat. There's no bear. Anxiety is really about worrying about the possibility that some sort of a threat may or may not occur in the future. So fear, you are in a dangerous, threatening situation right now. And anxiety, you are not in a dangerous situation right now, but you're worried about something that could occur in the future or something that occurred in the past even. So if you're in a threatening situation right now where you experience fear, it's easier to go through the stress response, so to speak. There's a beginning and an end. And just to recap the stress response, here you are, you're feeling relaxed until your brain detects a threat. Your stress response is activated to mobilize you, to prepare you to run away. So you respond to the threat that's in your environment, the stressor in this case, the bear. And when the danger has passed, you return to normal. There's quite a clear beginning and an end to this cycle. There's a clear beginning and end to the stress response when there is a very clear cut threat. So this is fear. We are designed to return to normal. We seek out balance. This is called homeostasis. Homeostasis is your body's way of keeping everything in control keeping everything in balance. So something happened, you responded to the threat, you got your stress response. And when the danger's over, things happen in your body 
to return everything back to normal, back to balance. Okay, let's see how this works when there's no obvious threat with you right now, when there's no bear in the room. So here you are, you're calm and relaxed, but something's happening for you. Your stress response is clearly getting activated because you're getting ready, you're mobilizing for something, but we're just not sure what that is yet. Physiology has completely changed now with the stress response. You're ready to fight or flight. But the problem is there's nothing to fight and there's nothing that you can see to run away from. So how does your body know it's okay to calm down? There's no returning to normal. You have to carry on with your day. You might be in work and you have to carry on working in this highly agitated state. And then you can add stuff to it. You're sitting there typing an email and wondering and getting scared. Why is my heart beating so fast? So how did you get from here to here in the first place? There's no threat that I can see. There's no bear. Do you remember when I said a few moments ago that we tend to get stuck between steps one and two of the stress response? And it's to do with what constitutes a threat for you. You are no longer out in the wilderness fighting daily for food and for your life where the stress response first evolved, where it was highly adaptive. You are probably at work or college, but the threats that you experience now are some of the worries that I spoke about at the beginning of this webinar when I got you to fill in the poll. It's money, your boss, your future, your relationship. Those are your threats. And this is really important. What takes you from being relaxed to getting mobilized, the start of the stress response? Your threats are worries. They are thought processes, basically. Now, there's another way that this can get activated, and I'll mention it briefly later. Now, I'm really going to hammer this home. In this case, your stress response is getting activated by thought processes, by what's going on inside your head. There's no bear present. Your life is not in danger. It's thought processes. If you remember earlier when I was using the horse for an example, when I showed you how he goes from relaxed to getting ready to running away from danger and returning back to normal, being calm, when I said at this stage, he's not worried about what other people think of him or how he's going to pay the bills. I wasn't being flippant. I was letting you know that he does not create anticipatory anxiety. He does not get more anxious down to his thought processes. He experiences the fear and deals with an immediate danger. The only thing that can activate the stress response for the horse is the presence of a real threat, a bear or some other predator. His stress response will not be activated by worrying about the state of the economy. And again, I'm not being flippant. I'm showing you the power of thoughts. Anticipatory anxiety is what you experience when you are thinking about an event or a situation that can occur in the future. So let's be clear, there's no obvious threat, there's no bear. Thoughts that come with anticipatory anxiety can be, what if I lose my job? What if people know that I am anxious? What if I have a panic attack? What if I can't pay my bills? I'm no good. These are your threats that take you from step one to step two on the stress response. It's your thought processes in this example that activates the stress response. And back to what I said right at the beginning, they really could do with a bit of tweaking to stop the anxiety. If you're having trouble at this stage thinking that your thought processes could be behind your anxiety, I get that. But your thoughts are pretty powerful stuff. Let me think of an example. Have you ever thought about sex? and notice some changes going on in your body. That's your thought processes. They can create real changes in your body, in your physiology. Or think about some foods that you like. For you, that might be a big, juicy steak. 
Think of your favourite food. Imagine what it tastes like cutting into it. Or think about desserts, apple pie, ice cream or fruit, burgers, fries, chicken. Just think about food. Think about what it would smell like. And as you bring it up to your mouth, imagine biting into it. Have you too much saliva in your mouth now? Your thoughts did that and only your thoughts. If you are aware that you have too much saliva in your mouth at the moment, your thought processes did that. Your body is now prepared. It thinks it's going to get something to eat. So it's already starting the digestive process for you. That is the power of your thoughts. So it follows then, if your thoughts can change your physiology just by me talking to you about food, they can certainly produce all the symptoms of anxiety that you feel when you are worried just by your thought processes. But thought processes are not the only way that can trigger the stress response. Your brain remembers to be anxious and I'm going to talk to you about that now. If you remember at the start of this webinar, I told you that I myself had anxiety. If you missed that bit, yes, I know I'm a psychologist and I was a psychologist when I had anxiety, but I'm also a human being too. In fact, my anxiety hit quite high levels as I had panic attacks. Anyway, during this time, I looked to cognitive behavioral therapy as that's what I was used to doing with people who had anxiety and panic attacks. But there was something missing for me. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy, it's an excellent model and I include it in all my programs. Even though I was able to work with my own thought processes, my cognitions, cognitions are just a fancy word for your thought processes, this and I'll come back and speak about CBT later, so don't worry if I don't cover it properly now. This worked to a certain extent for me, but I was still left with a certain amount of anxiety and the panic attacks were still there. They were occurring in the same places and I couldn't access any thought processes for me to work with in those situations. And that's what led me to looking at the brain. I needed to find some answers to help myself really and this was around the time when there was a considerable amount of research around the area of your brain and anxiety and this is when I came across that your brain can remember to be anxious. This new type of research filled in a lot of the gaps for me and answered a lot of questions that I had relating to my own experience of anxiety and indeed my own panic attacks when I discovered that there were two pathways that can lead to anxiety. One of them I've just been discussing with you now, that's our thought processes, which leads to anticipatory anxiety. But the other one really answered the questions for me when my anxiety just came out of the blue. I would be feeling fine and could have a panic attack out of the blue for no reason. For me anyway, for my own experience of anxiety, I started to realise that I had to unlearn some things that were happening in my brain. I had to retrain some faulty systems. I began to be able to make sense and finally understand my own experience of anxiety. And it was this, this new understanding for me that led me to develop the Retrain Your Brain programs that you've probably already seen on my website. This is going to answer a lot of questions for you if you're the type of person that gets anxiety or indeed panic attacks that seem to occur for no reason at all. This part of the webinar is going to be of interest to you if you find that your panic attacks just seem to occur out of the blue or if you seem to keep having them in the same situations and you're not really aware of any thought processes, you just get a panic attack. So what's happening here? What's going on? 
I'm going to try and break it down for you to give you some understanding. And to do so, I have to talk about a thing called the amygdala. And don't worry about the jargon. You're going to know this inside out and back to front by the time I've finished. The amygdala is behind many different things that you can experience. But for the purpose of helping you to understand your panic attacks, I need to talk about its role in the experience of fear, because this is going to answer some questions that you might have. The amygdala has a role in helping you to form emotional memories. Now, what do I mean by emotional memories? Now, for the purpose of this webinar in talking to you about panic attacks, I'm, there will be negative emotional memories. So let me get an example for you. Let's say you had to go out shopping and you found yourself in a large department store and out of nowhere you had a panic attack. Your amygdala can help you form an emotional memory of this because the experience of the panic attack was so strong it will want to protect you from it in the future. And this emotional memory will contain all the details going shopping and in particular the department store where you had your panic attack along with all the physical sensations and of the panic attack and all the fear that you experienced. It will record all of this. So the next time you go shopping and particularly into that exact same department store all of this is immediately available to you, including all the sensations and the fear associated with the original panic attack. It becomes a threat. Do you remember at the start of this webinar when I was talking about the stress response that for you to go from feeling relaxed and calm to getting ready to prepare for danger, your brain has to detect a threat and this emotional memory you've formed can be a threat. But it's a faulty threat, a mistaken threat and one that's not going to be helpful uh, for you. Remember when I said that the stress response is helpful in life or death situations where you can prepare for danger, run away and then return to normal. This mistaken threat is not helpful and it can result in you avoiding the department store or avoiding shopping altogether as you don't want to experience all of this again. It's your anxiety switch is getting turned on. It's like faulty wiring. So even though it feels like the panic attack comes out of the blue, there is a reason and I can help you to understand this because once you understand something, you're in a position to be able to fix it. But if you do nothing and your brain keeps seeing this as a threat, this emotional memory that your brain has formed, there's a good chance you will avoid it altogether and this just keeps giving more and more evidence to your brain this is something dangerous for me and your anxiety switch stays on. You're in an unfortunate position now with this anxiety switch stuck on as the stress response was not designed for this. It's designed for a quick burst of energy when you need it and then to turn off again to help you relax. There are so many things working together that make it quite difficult for you to calm down at this stage. It's difficult to turn that switch off unless we look at them individually and you understand what's happening. So let's take a look at what's going on now. Just to remind you, your stress response is designed to take you from being relaxed to mobilizing you, getting you ready when your brain detects a threat so that you can either fight the threat or run away and then you return to normal, the switch goes off. Or put more simply, this switch is turned on when your brain detects a threat and turns off again when it's no longer needed to conserve energy. Think of it as turning off a, a light switch when you leave a room, you don't want to leave it burning. But unfortunately, with anticipatory anxiety and emotional memories, and these are only two things that I'm introducing you to during this we webinar, 
the switch is constantly turned on. Let's look at an example using emotional memory. Say you did have a panic attack in a department store, but you wanted to try it again. But as soon as you got near the store, your brain saw this as a threat. The emotional memory was there and you started to panic again. So you went home. So you've left the department store, but you don't want this to get the better of you. So you decide, OK, I'm going to try this again. But you're getting hit with anticipatory anxiety now. There's no threat to you. There's no bear. But that what if I get a panic attack? What if I can't breathe? You're getting stuck in a vicious cycle of anxiety now. And let's look at it in terms of the steps of the stress response. Look at step one, where originally you were relaxed and OK. But as you approached the department store, your brain detected a threat. The emotional memory of a previous panic attack in the department store was enough to activate the stress response and mobilize you to get you ready to either fight or run away. And you run away if you're avoiding and that's OK. But you don't calm down. You're still pumped with all the feelings and sensations of having a panic attack. And now you're getting further hit with anticipatory anxiety. What if this doesn't go away? What if I die? What if my heart gives up? So you get stuck in step three. OK, so hopefully you're beginning to understand there are reasons that you get a panic attack, even though it feels like they come out of the blue. There are reasons. So that's great. How can you fix it? Well, you can choose to do nothing. Chances are then nothing's going to change. Or you can take action. You can face this head on and do a little bit of tweaking. Do you remember at the start when I spoke about the stress response and says that we get stuck and some things need tweaked? Specifically, you need to do something between steps one and two. What constitutes a threat? And at step four, you need to learn how to induce a relaxation response. Now, there's more to it than that, but those are the big things that will help on tweaking what constitutes a threat. That's what actually triggers the stress response in the first place. Cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT, is excellent at this stage in helping you with anticipatory anxiety, all the what ifs. CBT will work with the idea that some of your thought processes and some thought patterns that you have are unhelpful and may contribute to the anxiety you're experiencing and you'll be shown how to change them. But I would also personally recommend that you tackle both the pathways to anxiety, not just the thought processes. Remember when I said it can arise from anticipatory anxiety, your thoughts, but also when your panic attacks seem to come out of the blue, you need an understanding of your brain, of emotional memory, how your brain remembers how to be anxious. I would recommend tackling both pathways. So if you do CBT, you also need to work with the patterns in your brain. But you also need to force step four to happen. The stress response, remember I said about homeostasis that were designed to calm down, to come back to normal. You have to take steps for this to happen if you're experiencing panic attacks. This will include a new learning, teaching your brain that you're OK in situations that previously made you panic. You unlearn the habits of anxiety. You retrain your brain to be calm. Also, I would recommend for step four our simple breathing and relaxation exercises. Now, before you poo poo it and decide I don't like the breathing exercise, did you know that when you breathe in, you turn your anxiety switch on a little and when you breathe out, you start to turn it off? 
And there's another thing which is extremely helpful. And if I can take you right back to the start of this webinar, when I said you're going to learn about your brain on anxiety and why you need to dumb it down a bit. The dumb it down a bit is to do with intelligence. If you remember, I said you get anxious because you are smart, because you can think. Now, I don't want to take away your intelligence, but we kind of need to react like the horse. He didn't worry. Nor did he wake up at 3.30 in the morning, like myself in the original story, and worry about everything and nothing. In other words, he didn't add fuel to the fire. He did not make it worse with anticipatory anxiety. So in dumbing it down, I mean having the ability to ask yourself, is this thought useful? Is this thought helping me or harming me? And teaching yourself, giving yourself the ability to let go of thought processes that are not useful. Having this ability to let go of thoughts that are not useful or that are unhelpful to you and having the ability not to worry about things that have not yet happened. This is where mindfulness comes in. In my experience, to give yourself the best possible chance to recover from panic attacks, you need a combination of approaches. I would recommend the cognitive behavioral therapy. Also, an understanding of how your brain works, relaxation and mindfulness. Now, you can do this on your own or for those of you that are interested, I have this, all of this already included in my Retrain Your Brain series for panic attacks. And for those of you that are interested, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes and let you know what it's about. You will learn about your own unhelpful thought processes and be shown how to change them. You will also uncover the deeply held beliefs that you have about yourself using cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT. Did you know that most of the things that you do every day are habitual, almost unconscious and are driven by the deeply held beliefs you have about yourself? And it's really important that you know these as most of them are negative. I'm not good enough. I'm useless. I'm a failure. I'm unlovable. I'm unlikable. They become I like to think of it as a script in your head, almost like your life story, except nobody tells you that this is playing inside your head. So you don't know that it's driving every aspect of your life. This is covered in my course. These self-doubts that you have about yourself, these self-limiting beliefs, I not only cover them in my course, but I show you how to change them. You can change that script, that story that plays in your head. And that will not only help you with anxiety and panic, it will help in all aspects of your life. I created this course to give you understanding as once you understand the problem, once you understand your panic attacks, you're in a position of power where you can fix it and you can change them. But also to give you access to all the materials that helped me. My course, it's designed really to mimic what you would get if you saw me in person, but it gives you so much more. Many of you will already know that I have a private practice and it's designed around the instructions I give when people come to see me in private practice. But I find that there are so many things that I can give you on this course that was just impossible for me in one to one sessions in private practice. It's easier for you to understand concepts using the animation that I provide in the courses. And you have the added advantage that you don't have to remember everything that I say. You can access your course 24 hours a day, seven days a week from any device at a time and location that's convenient for you. I'm going to give you a quick overview of what's included in the course. You get a complete cognitive behavioral therapy training, complete CBT package. 
And in addition to this, I also give you information on your brain, showing you the different pathways that can create anxiety and assessments for you to figure out yourself what's causing your anxiety and then show you how to fix it. I also take you through your brain and memory and emotions. I touched on this briefly in this webinar and talk to you fully and in depth about how your brain remembers how to be anxious. And I take my time and explain to you where all those symptoms of anxiety come from when you're experiencing a panic attack. I really wanted to cover this because for me, that was a very frightening aspect of panic. And once you understand it, it takes the fear away. I also included distraction techniques and exercises, things to help you during a panic attack. I considered this really important because I know myself, they're extremely frightening. So these are to help you during a panic attack. And there's a section on mindfulness, on meditation. And in this section, there are two downloadable MP3s. One is a guided relaxation and the other one is to help you with sleep. I've made this as comprehensive as possible everything that I could possibly think of that's going to help you with panic attacks, I've included them in the course. I'm going to pull everything together now for you to the best of my ability. Thank you. First of all, thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to this webinar. And if you got this far, you're serious about wanting to recover from panic attacks. So please take action either through my course using all my materials or working with someone else. It really doesn't matter. Just please do something. Take action because you really can get over panic attacks. You can retrain your brain and unlearn anxiety. Thank you once again for taking time out and coming along and listening to what I had to say. I really do hope that you find some of it useful. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now. Take care.